lethal and non-monotonic, non-linear effects from environmental chemicals. Now, in medicine, hormone level drugs that exert a greater effect at a low dose level at parts per billion, parts per trillion, are not controversial. Yet they seem to be controversial every time doctors and epidemiologists want to talk about environmental chemicals causing greater harm at a low level. Can you flesh this out a bit, Bruce, and help people understand this this kind of crazy phenomenon? Yeah. Well, let me do it with with lead. Um, and and lead has some endocrine disrupting properties, uh, but not all of its properties are via the endocrine system. I first saw this about 20 years ago, and the first time I saw it, it actually went right over my head because I was trained to think that chemicals at low levels or metals at low levels were innocuous or safe. I was also taught to think that either there's a threshold that is no effect until you get to a certain concentration, or for carcinogens that there's a linear no threshold model. So I really operated almost from the standpoint of that there's going to be linear relationships. So it's a very simplistic way of thinking about it. Well, the first time I saw it, it went over my head. The second time I saw it, we were looking at what happens as blood lead levels increase in a group of children. And we saw that beginning at the lowest measurable levels, there was a steep decrement. And then at higher levels, it was attenuated or decelerated. So the first 10 microgram per deciliter and increase in blood lead was associated with about a six to seven IQ point drop. The second 10 microgram per deciliter increase was about a two to two and a half IQ point drop. And the third was about a one IQ point drop. So proportionately, we saw greater harms at the lowest levels. Now, if you flip that around, that's called the decelerating dose response relationship. If we shift that around, we can see the same pattern with something like uh, airborne particles, PM 2.5 and death from cardiovascular disease. But now here, we've kind of flipped it and it's almost the mirror image. At low levels, we see immediately a steep increase in the risk of dying prematurely from heart disease. And then at higher levels, it decelerates or flattens out. So now that has been seen for lead and IQ deficits, lead and cardiovascular disease mortality. Again, at higher levels, it, it increases sharply and then decelerates. PM 2.5 and, and uh, mortality, benzene and leukemia, um, and asbestos and mesothelioma. Now, one of the things that uh, those have in common is they are the most well-studied and widely disseminated toxic chemicals out there, right? I've not found any evidence in human studies for a threshold. Well, maybe with one exception, and that's mercury in fish. And it's not definitive, but you do see some evidence, and it may be simply because most of the methylmercury we ingest is in fish, and fish and, is beneficial. And so a threshold is the lowest safe dose you can have for a lifetime. That's that's the idea. That's correct. Yeah. And so with something like mercury and fish, it may be that there's no threshold, but because there are benefits to ingesting the vehicle, in this case, thinking of mercury as, as the, the major agent, it may mask any threshold. So the idea that there are thresholds and the whole idea of hormesis as maybe these chemicals are beneficial at low levels, I've not seen any evidence in human studies for that. No. And and I think was it um, Professor Philippe Grandjean talked about the fact that he is suspects perhaps that environmentally relevant levels of fluoride in the environment, we have we have grown the capacity to tolerate that, but it doesn't mean it's beneficial. As well, if we were living on the diets that our grandparents and great grandparents had 
with consumed with lots of fiber for example we would be moving those heavy metals or whatever they were through our system so much more quickly and so we wouldn't have probably prolonged exposures in the dietary tract perhaps so there's all these sort of things that you can think about yes it could be at an environmentally relevant level but that doesn't mean that today in an urban population we could even tolerate that level right now well and you have to stop and ask what is an environmentally what is the background levels to something like lead and mercury? And one of my favorite slides that I was introduced to by Thomas Clarkson, who's international mercury expert, this was now 30 years ago. He had this slide that showed on a log scale that the essential elements like sodium and uh, calcium were in the primordial oceans where our single cell, single cell ancestors evolved at very high concentrations. Lead and mercury, on the other hand, were there in very minuscule concentrations. And so we never developed the mechanisms to tolerate them or the physiologic need for them because they weren't really there in high enough concentrations. So even though you might think, well, lead and mercury, they're elemental. They've been with us all along. Yes, that's true, but not at the concentrations that we've seen over the past two or 300 years during the industrial, or even longer in some cases, um, during industrialization or during the Roman era where they were starting to uh, refine metals and smelt metals. And so it's possible that having more fiber in the diet would reduce some of those exposures, but we're exposed to levels, well, 30 years ago, it was levels uh, about 6,000 times higher than our pre-industrial ancestors. And even today, for lead, 10 to 100 times higher than our pre-industrial ancestors. Pretty astonishing. Could you please talk a little bit about, for example, what um, uh, a chemical class uh, might mean and what additive effects from a chemical class might mean, but then also talk about what synergistic effects might mean, please. Right. Well, this is something um, Rachel Carson talked about synergistic effects of OP pesticides in Silent Spring. Um, I, I've not seen evidence of that in humans, but we certainly have a number of examples of synergistic effects. And, and in fact, Tobacco seems to be what one of my students called the great synergizer. It seems to interact synergistically with several things. So if you think back on the century long epidemic of lung cancer, we mostly blame tobacco for that. And it does appear to be the major reason for the century long epidemic of lung cancer, but it wasn't the only risk factor. So for example, um, Pershagen found that both for arsenic and radon, if you're exposed to tobacco smoke and arsenic or radon simultaneously, the increased risk isn't just ten, tenfold for tobacco and twofold for arsenic, it's 25 fold if you're exposed to both. And so that's the idea of this synergistic effect. When you have two toxic chemicals uh, and you're exposed to both, you might think in some cases it is additive, but in other cases it's mul multiplicative and it has a big impact on the risk. Uh, and there are undoubtedly, even though we have some good examples for lung cancer, tobacco plus asbestos, tobacco plus radon, tobacco plus arsenic. For lead and tobacco, we see that they act synergistically and increase the risk of children developing ADHD. But there are undoubtedly lots of different examples that we haven't even begun to understand in this cocktail of chemicals that we're constantly bathed in.